please um, welcome Larry Lindgren. He is our Kansas GFOA board member and he will be providing the introductions and thank yous this morning. Larry? Well, first I'd like to express thanks to RSM who is willing to sponsor the conference, provide this presentation. Without them, we would not have been able to deliver the annual conference. Uh, you should, we are also grateful for their support of KSGFOA and appreciate their willingness to support the virtual conference. Uh, attendees should go to the conference website and check out their company profile and resource board information. There's a lot of good information there. Um, the session today is called uh, Succession and Workforce Planning in the Government Sector. And as I'm retiring in February, that is a very important subject to me. Um, the description is a current global health crisis has created unique challenges that have caused organizations to rethink their future. Organizations are both dying and surging at the same time. COVID-19 has shed light on a crucial element of running a solid organization, succession and workforce planning. Succession and workforce planning are needed now more than ever to ensure organizations are prepared for the future. The true value of a comprehensive succession and workforce plan has never been more apparent than in today's uncertainty. Our presenter today is Michael Shedak. He's a manager in human, uh, human capital consulting, RSM, US LLP. As a management consultant at RSM, Michael specializes in human resources management and employee productivity for companies in a variety of industries. His focus on optimizing human resource strategies and objectives helps clients to understand and solve complex issues surrounding people, process, and technology. Prior to joining RSM, Michael provided human resource services at a leading global consulting firm, providing a broad base of consulting services. Michael's areas of human resource management consulting expertise include the following service offerings organizational assessment, design and succession planning services, human resources compliance, and leading practices consulting, payroll compliance and design services, compensation and incentive planning services, human resources policy and practices assessment, HCM and payroll system selection and implementation services, performance management planning services, human resource strategy and advisory services. Michael has a master's degree with an emphasis on human resources and organizational development and a bachelor's degree in human and business. Uh, he was an honors graduate. Uh, organizations he's involved in, are, he's uh, certified as a senior professional in human resources by the Human Resource Certification Institute. He's a member of the Society of Human Resource Management as a senior certified professional in human resources, a member of the Eastern Iowa Human Resource Association, a member of World at Work Human Resource Association. So that's, that's a lot of information there and I, I'm sure he's got a lot to, to give to us. So uh, we welcome Michael, thank you. Awesome. Great, Larry. I'm, I'm definitely happy to be here today. That was a great introduction. I don't have anything else to add. Um, so appreciate the, the time, guys, here to, to touch base with you and talk through some of the things that we're seeing out there from a you know, succession planning or workforce planning perspective, uh, not only with, you know, uh, specifically with our public sector clients, but it also is um, obviously an issue, a topic that's important to you know, other industries and private sector clients as well too. So again, just, just happy to be here today. Um, as you can see from my video, um, I am out on our sun porch today. We've been uh, working from home since March. Uh, I'm sure many of you have as well. And it's, it's kind of funny. I always enjoy being out, out here on my sun porch. I, uh, I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, actually the um, founding, um, office for RSM almost 100 years ago. Um, but similar to you guys, we have swings in weather. So I felt like, uh, you know, when, when COVID hit, I was loving it because I was able to sit out here and see the light of day. And then, uh, you know, it started getting warm and it gets about 150 degrees in here during the day. So um, 
in the middle of summer. So I had to go downstairs. So I guess you get to see kind of the trees in the background. Otherwise it would be an unfinished cement wall today. <laughs> um, so just a little bit, you know, Larry gave a great introduction for myself. If you're not familiar with RSM, you know, we are one of the leaders or the leader in mid-market clients for assurance tax and consulting services. Um, you know, we've got locations across the United States um, do a lot of different work um, in terms of those three areas and, um, you know, almost have 11,000 professionals. So, um, you know, we've got a, a, a lot of insight, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of specialization that I think is pertinent to what we're discussing today. Um, so as we talk about, you know, what we do as a firm, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on those different resources. But, you know, if you just look at our firm as a whole, I mean, traditionally, it's been a, uh, you know, a audit and uh, accounting or tax firm. Uh, we also have a very strong uh, consulting practice, which is, uh, you know, continues to grow and is continuing to grow to almost be a third of our, our business. So just wanted to kind of highlight some of the different areas that we do help organizations with, um, and specifically help uh, public sector clients with. So we've got a, a technology and, and digital team. We've got a finance and accounting team. We've got um, a team that does operations and supply chain. And we've got a team that does mergers and acquisitions. And then I, I've highlighted the best group, right? The human capital consulting practice. So, um, you know, we're in this every day. We're working with clients, leaders um, regarding um, challenges in acting and engaging employees, managing retention, um, looking at succession planning, and, you know, taking into consideration all of those events and aspects of the people side of the business so that we can be successful and that we have a plan going forward. So again, Larry mentioned a little bit about our topic today, and it's an interesting topic, right? Um, you know, we, we've done this presentation a, a number of times at similar financial, public sector, um, associations and groups uh, in different cities. Um, again, it seems to be one of those hot topics that, you know, is kind of always in the back of your mind, but ultimately, you know, it takes, uh, you know, a, a seminar like this or a little bit more information to really start thinking about it. Um, if you haven't started to already, or, um, you know, ultimately building out what you've already got in place today. So, so really, you know, when we talk about or hear some of these, I guess, uh, quotes or ideas around silver tsunami, brain drain, workforce cliff. I mean, these are all um, different sayings used to describe the baby boomers um, in the government workforce that are near retirement age or who'll, who will be um, exiting the organization uh, shortly. And so, you know, as a result, there's lots of knowledge, leadership, experience with them that those uh, baby boomers will be, will, be, will be taking. And so many uh, organizations, especially in the public sector, have decided to proactively address those issues, while um, some have just started to kind of breach that topic. So they not, may not be as far along um, in that process as, as maybe they'd like to be or as they need to be to successfully have some of those transitions. So really today, you know, we're gonna talk through what some of that might look like. We're gonna talk about some examples and um, understand what we can do to kind of bridge that gap between, you know, the workforce that we have today, uh, how we attract and retain key employees and how we transfer that, that knowledge and bring qualified high potential employees up through the organization. So, you know, as we, as we go through this, just, you know, have, have some thoughts and kind of think about where does your organization stand today? Have you started to implement any of these thoughts um, or processes? Uh, and, you know, what can we do to make it more effective and um, procedural within our organization? So, you know, although um, succession planning has, in workforce planning has really been kind of that hot topic um, over the last few years, uh, the impacts of COVID-19 have really um, pushed it to the forefront. I mean, the 
pandemic has really moved some of these thoughts, some of these peripheral issues into our line of sight, right? So again, we talked a little bit about the baby boomers, but there is a vulnerability there um, with the uh, um, advent of the uh, coronavirus in terms of the age of um, you know, our workforce. If we've got an older population, you know, there is some concern uh, with that, especially, uh, and it's true because obviously COVID impact, as we all know, affects um, older folks uh, disappropriately over age 60. So there's, there's that thought that, you know, I think has started to become apparent in our succession planning process. You know, the, the, the second one would be volatility and inefficiency. So, you know, the economy had been doing fairly well. Um, you know, if your organization was doing well, there may have been some underlying weaknesses structurally um, that may have really been put on the back burner, something that we, you know, we were just kind of putting off because we are doing well and we're focusing on growth moving forward. But, you know, as we've gone months in this pandemic, um, you know, further uh, COVID-19 has uh, swamped many organizational le leaders with, you know, operational issues. So, you know, are people going out on leave? Do we work in the office? What does technology look like for these people? Um, and quite frankly, it just may be too much for one person. It may be something that, you know, leaders within an organization maybe don't, don't want to or, or need to handle at this time. And so there's just, you know, that thought that there is this aspect of, you know, the pandemic, if we do have some gaps or weaknesses, it really is bringing those to the forefront. And then just transparency, right? Our stakeholders, our constituents um, are asking some difficult questions around what our future looks like. And, and that's true of both public and private sector, right? There's just this sense of uncertainty. And, you know, we don't always have the answer. Um, we can plan for the best and make adjustments as we go. Um, but again, you know, as we look at this process, there's definitely um, this, this, uh, this change in thought and change that, you know, this was an important piece of our workforce before, but now that we're in COVID, there are definitely some impacts that bring some of these thoughts even closer to the forefront of what we're trying to accomplish. So today, um, I wanna take some time and just talk through some tactics around workforce planning and succession planning, um, looking at how we tailor our actions to the talent needs of our organization and why these are important. Um, I've got a couple of examples that I'll sprinkle in of, of projects that we've worked on or scenarios that we've seen. And then I wanna leave a few minutes at the end of the presentation just to see if there's any questions or thoughts that the, that the group might have on some of these thoughts uh, today. So let's jump into workforce planning. Um, so workforce planning is really an art and a science. Um, it's a strategy that we put in place. There's no, um, well, I guess it, it tends to be more gray rather than black and white, right? And it's really the process of understanding our business and where we're going and determining the right number of qualified people um, in the, the correct positions at the right time. So essentially, I, I think what's important here is the right number of people and the right number of qualified people, right? If we just put bodies into positions where, um, you know, they might not have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to do the job um, the way we need it to be done and perform, um, that, that really doesn't help us from a workforce planning perspective. And, you know, from a workforce planning perspective, there's really a number of different tactics that can be used as we try to understand and plan for the future. Um, and so I want to pause there, but we'll get into some of those uh, on, the, on the next slide here as we move along. Now, from a succession planning standpoint, I think where organizations probably get a little hung up is it's really a process. It's not an event, right? So um, it's not something that we just take a look at each year um, for a couple of days and uh, come up with a plan. It's, it's, it's something that 
you'll see in my comments throughout this pre presentation, it, it really is something that needs to be ingrained into our culture that we're continuing to think about um, and adjust to bridge gaps and maybe provide training and bring people into a context where they can perform a job adequately and, and move up within the organization. Um, and, and really it's that process for identifying a new talent pool, new talent opportunities within the, the organization to fill um, key, key positions and leadership positions. I think another pitfall that we typically see is, hey, you know, we've really got to look at our executive level positions and come up with a succession planning process. That is absolutely true. But, but where organizations fall short is that there are people within the organization that also have um, duties that you know, are, are, are very important to um, the organization that maybe they only know how to do or they only have the, the skills to do. And so um, I, I would advise um, the folks on the call today that when we're looking at succession planning, it really needs to be not only leadership, but also some of those key roles and key positions that we have in the, in the organization. And then through that succession planning process, there's your ability to also recruit folks that, that have some of those key abilities that you're looking for that might not be within the organization, but also to develop the knowledge, skills, and abilities of maybe high-performing individuals within the organization to be able to advance and promote them into a, a more challenging position or leadership role. Um, so, Workforce planning, really, it's it's all about supply and demand. And, and I apologize, I'm not sure why that chart is a little bit blurry, but I, I can walk you through what kind of the gist of that is. I mean, so, um, you know, when we look at talent demand, it's, it's basically looking at our staffing needs, um, timing by job role, productivity targets, um, you know, the cost of the workforce. When we look at supply, you know, how, how many folks do we have with the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we need to be within um, our organization? So um, when we look at supply, we're looking at, you know, is there a turnover risk? You know, what does retirement look like? Um, what is the talent availability, you know, within our industry, within, um, you know, our, our city, our state? And so, you know, looking at that supply and demand, helps to uh, put forth some of the planning activities that we typically will associate with workforce planning. And what that can do is it leads to a number of different benefits. I mean, it really aligns um, strategic plans with you know, the number of employees or headcount that, that you'd like to have or that you're planning for within the organization, which is a, it's a big piece of the puzzle, right? Um, we need to strategize of what we anticipate we're gonna look like and the skills that we're gonna to need to carry out the functions of our organization. So that goes back to you know, being a little bit gray. It's not totally black and white. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's an art, not a science. Um, you know, other benefits are that it creates a clear view of talent. Um, you know, we talked about the demand and supply and those reporting relationships. And it can provide managers easy to use reports and tools um, to determine the impact of their talent decisions and prioritizes future workforce investments. So I guess that was a long sentence. I mean, basically what we're saying here is that managers um, have the reporting capability to understand the decisions that they make from a workforce planning perspective um, and what that's gonna cost and how that benefits um, the organization. And again, those metrics, those, that ability to be able to identify what that looks like and how we control um, new headcount, um, skills and abilities, uh, really helps us to uh, have a competitive advantage and a, a planned process for that workforce planning. It gives business leaders you know, that consistency in terms of knowing where we're at today and where we're headed um, going forward, and those outcomes are, are measurable, and meaningful to the to the leadership in the organization as well as um, management level positions. So, why is this important? I mean, for a number of reasons, right? We've already talked a little bit about organizations, um, 
you, you know, having a, 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 a maybe a higher percentage of baby boomers, uh, specifically in public sector, right? It was a very, um, and is a very um, sought after position within the organizations, you know, typically have good benefits. People have been there for a while, there's tenure, but um, from an overall perspective, public sector organizations have indicated that, you know, they could lose up to 20% or more of their employees to retirement within the next five years. And I've typically seen that, um, you know, it range anywhere from 20 to 40%, right? Um, of our maybe executive level positions that they're on track for retirement. And so, um, you know, out of those surveyed, only an estimated 27% have succession plans in place. And I think that's pretty consistent across all industries. We typically see that, you know, around 60 to 70% of organizations probably know it's important, but don't have, um, you know, a, a, an actual formal succession planning process in place. And, and, and when that's not in place and we have people leave, they're taking that knowledge with them um, unless there's, you know, a plan for retention of their expertise, their, their processes, um, and some of that, what we call tribal knowledge, right? They've just been with the organization uh, for, for a long time and they've seen how things have progressed and they have some of that history that um, somebody else would not have if they were new to the organization. Um, you know, uh, low unemployment rates pre-COVID, so if we're talking before COVID, really made it difficult to find qualified applicants. Um, you know, I think you'll see in some of the slides and the survey data that, that I've got in this PowerPoint as we move forward, we, we kind of hit on that a little bit in that it's, it's, it's definitely was hard to find um, qualified candidates to, to bring into our organization, to move up with our organization, um, just because the economy was doing so good. Um, now in the midst of COVID-19, the pandemic, you know, things have kind of switched in, in, in a, I guess, not really switched, but you, you know, they're framed up differently, right? So there's this thought and, you know, this, this shift that we're seeing in a lot of our clients is that, you know, we're really trying to attract and retain the clients um, that we, or, I'm sorry, the, the key employees that we have today, because Again, there are organizations that are doing very, very well right now. Um, and obviously there's organizations that um, are not doing well. And the organizations that are, that are successful or being successful during um, COVID-19, this pandemic, <clears throat> have the ability to potentially attract um, and you know, take good employees from your organization if you don't have the, the, the proper um, you know, controls in place to, to retain those employees. So, so we do see a lot of um, organizations looking at succession planning because of this reason, um, looking at employee engagement, looking at compensation. Those are all areas that we, we historically as a human capital consulting practice have been busy in, uh, but we're definitely just as busy or even busier right now um, because organizations are wanting to attract, retain, and, and keep those employees that they have today. Um, you know, as we look at COVID's impact towards leadership development, uh, you know, I found this from uh, the Institute for Corporate Productivity. I thought it was pretty interesting. And basically, I'll just kind of give you the high level of what this is saying. So for organizations that do have leadership development programs, um, you know, 73% are delivering them virtually, right? So maybe there was a leadership program training that was done on site or maybe uh, in another location so that switched to virtually. Um, and 70% have delayed those, right? So in the midst of the pandemic, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, so organizations have decided to delay or reschedule any sort of those leadership programs. Um, and 60% are asking leaders to do really some things on their own. So if there's training, self-paced learning, things that they can do online um, with leadership development content, that's another area um, <clears throat> where, where this transition has happened to be 
more virtual uh, in terms of learning and leadership development. And then it, as you can see, there's some that have canceled programs or decreased um, development programs. But again, I think the, the big shift here is, um, you know, these leadership programs are more self-paced, more um, electronic um, and delivered virtually at this point. But again, I just thought that was an interesting um, thought and interesting data as I was putting this, this slide deck together. So what do we know? How about some additional uh, labor statistics? Um, we know that there's about 34.9 million 55 and older workers in the US labor force. Those baby boomers, um, there's, a, there's a big portion of them. Um, and the labor force participation rate has been almost 63% for the past few years, which is down from 66%. And workers 55 or older um, will decline <laughs> due to retirement and constitute nearly one fourth of the labor force in 2024. So, um, you know, we, we, we've got that big population of uh, baby boomers um, that will decline, but again, nearly uh, a fourth of our labor force will still be in effect. Um, so job tenure of workers 50 and older is, is, is three times longer than workers under age 50. Again, we talked about that longevity for that group of individuals. Um, you know, we've got the, the younger folks, the millennials that um, it's not as big of a deal to, um, to go from position to position to gain, uh, you know, faster track towards getting to where you want to be professionally. Whereas, you know, some of our baby boomers have been around for uh, a number of years and have had loyalty to the organization. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also, baby boomers, uh, again, will remain the wealthiest generation up until 2030. Um, and as the start, stock market goes up, employees' wealth will increase and uh, retirement becomes more foreseeable. Well, again, that, you know, COVID has kind of contradicted that thought where, you know, um, if the, uh, if the, um, if the organization or, you um, you know, the stock market goes down, it may have a, an impact on some of our uh, baby boomers where they may stick around a little longer, but then it becomes even more increasingly important to, to you know, to have that, you know, I don't wanna say backup plan, but essentially that succession plan, where we've got people on the reins that can start to take over some of those important processes um, and, and ensure that we're successful going forward. And despite, the, the baby boomers generation, uh, generational reputation for being workaholics, average retirement age is 61 to 65. So, um, you know, we do see that probably increasing a little bit with, with COVID, but, you know, again, we're in this period of uncertainty. So uh, we'll just kind of have to watch that and see how things go. So a, a quick example here. So we've got a situation here, a state agency faced a, a state mandate payroll budget decrease um, and you know coupled with rising payroll benefits costs so they they really needed to um, have about a million dollar budget cut which really when you think about that amount of money it, it typically does require decreasing headcount so what what can you do here well there's some things that you can do to get creative so one of them would be leveraging your existing workforce. Um, so plan to see where you can tighten things up. Um, you know, look at the organizational structure and evaluate workloads. If there's workloads that can be shared, you know, we can get creative about operational ef efficiency. You know, if there's positions that, um, you know, are outstanding or open today, is there ways that we can ultimately, um, you know, share those duties with other positions today so that we don't have to bring in that additional headcount. So, you know, I think, you know, as we look at a scenario where there are budget cuts, we just need to look at how we can be more efficient and define where those key roles are um, in our organization and make sure that we do have a, a plan for um, continuing, continuing to build out and um, make those roles successful within the organization. So 
Um, here's a quote from Mary C. Jennings. She's, I, I think, the CEO of the Governance Institute. Uh, I just like this quote, right? Um, the risk of not having a succession or contingency plan in place is far worse than the anxiety and effort in developing them. Um, you know, as we look at data or surveys or benchmarking around succession planning and workforce planning, <clears throat> you know, two thirds of organizations typically will say it's a very important process. And then you keep looking at the data and maybe a third um, or a little more than a third are actually doing succession planning. So I think there's this thought that, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's on the back burner, right? Like we know it's something we've got to do. Um, are we actually actively involved in workforce and succession planning? Um, if not, you know, it may be something that, you know, we should consider because the fallout of not having that can, can definitely be again worse, according to Marianne, um, than the, the process of actually developing um, the succession planning. So, so really, we, we talk about taking a proactive approach. So most organizations, again, aren't prepared just based on the, the data, more reactive than proactive. So, you know, this really does create an opportunity to take strategic action and reduce risk, right? Ultimately, you know, again, if we know we should have it, it's been on the back burner, in order to reduce risk, we should probably um, look at implementing some, some programs that support our succession and workforce planning process. Um, you know, retirements, again, are always that eminent concern. So there's a couple of things that you can do um, to help mitigate that risk. So creating redundancies and structures um, so that if anybody quits, becomes sick, you know, uh, I used to say got ran over by a bus, but now I say win the lottery. You know, if somebody were to leave the organization, <clears throat> you know, we've got that backup. We've got that culture where we understand what they're doing um, so that we can support uh, successful um, processing. You know, the uh, another one would be removing barriers and org structure so um, people can innovate and achieve what is asked of them. So a lot of times we'll see you know, especially government sector, but also private sector, siloed functions within the organization. If we remove those and communicate more, um, that can be very beneficial in, in helping us to uh, make efficiencies and grow our organizations. Um, and then, you know, we've got level three to that proactive approach, just investing in a culture that thrives for self-betterment, right? We talked about the culture of succession planning. It's not an event, it's more of a culture that lives within your organization. Um, so, you know, included in that, you know, continued learning, education, self-betterment, I think those are all strategies that are helpful throughout this process. So again, this might be one of the most important initiatives you take on um, to facilitate driving strategy and achievement. Just again, thinking of ways to be proactive is, is important. So how do I be proactive? How do I get all this going? Um, you know, I, I provided just a couple of high level thoughts here. The first one, obviously, strike your strategy, right? Um, where are we at as an organization? Where do we wanna be going forward? Um, once we have that strategy determined, then we can really perform that workforce assessment. Um, and so that assessment would include looking at <clears throat> the people and skills we have today, um, any future strategic goals of the organization, and what that future state will look like with, um, with our employee population and knowledge, skills, and abilities. And once we've determined what our current state versus our future state is, we can identify any gaps that we have in organizational structure, um, knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, and select tactics. So whether that's you know additional trainings, whether it's a formal succession planning process, different um, different ways to engage employees, those tactics can be implemented to build out that. Um, 
workforce planning and succession planning process. And once those tactics are implemented, you know, again, we want to make sure this is an you know, a, a ongoing process. This particular slide is a circle, right? It continues. So we want to continually measure and monitor um, our progress. And if we need to revise, right? We, we Organizations have hit a rough patch with COVID, right? That, that's an opportunity to revise where we're trying to go as an organization. So how do we get started, right? You know, we talked a little bit about this, but um, assessing our current workforce against future demands, economic trends, political factors, <laughs> global pandemics, right? Um, I know there's a lot of uncertainties there, but at least <clears throat> planning for the future, I think helps to bridge some of those gaps. Um, and, and like I said, reviewing those tactics. There's a couple of ways, or I guess, methods or approaches for getting started. The first one I wanted to mention was the workforce approach. So this really examines the current workforce, the occupations of projects, the number of characteristics of jobs, the number of employees needed to fill them at a specific point in the future. So basically it's just looking at what we need from an employee resource standpoint in the future. And um, you know, do we have the employees to be able to fill that at a specific point in time? Another approach you could consider or in combination of would be focusing on the amount and type of work the organization anticipates handling at a specific point in the future, and then using this information to project the number of people. So we think we're gonna grow, um, add these three departments. So from a uh, specific point in the future, we know that we're gonna need 10 full-time employees here to be able to perform that work. So, um, you know, this approach really takes a look at our workload. Um, you know, are we able to leverage technology and <clears throat> uh, reduce headcount or, you know, are we taking on more work as an organization where we need to increase that? The other approach is a competency approach. I mean, I typically see this one more often than not in where we're setting competencies that align with what we're trying to accomplish as an organization. Um, and so these competencies would, you know, if, a, if an employee demonstrates these competencies, it would show us that they have the focus and the ability to, you know, invest in and move up within the organization. And so I've got some samples of that later on, but I, I, I like the competency-based approach because we've got a defined structure for identifying our high performing employees. And we've indicated what types of knowledge, skills and abilities we're looking for and that they possess to be able to, to move forward and dedicate time and resources to their development. So, um, you know, how do we get started? A couple of phases that you can look at if you're wanting to get started with um, succession planning, workforce planning, if, if, if the organization hasn't already started to do that. Um, again, aligning your actions with the mission and vision and priorities and core values of the organization and identifying any issues or challenges or opportunities. Um, so again, this process looks at, kind of starts at the top of the picture. So what is our organization trying to accomplish? And then identifying from that, you know, our most critical areas um, and where we want to develop that succession planning to roll up to kind of that overall strategy. <clears throat> so that's really that, that uh, top-down thought. And there's, there's another phase that typically is included where we kind of look at it from the bottom up, right? So we look at where we're at from a historical staffing perspective, um, the number of employees we have, the number of job duties we have, and just analyze uh, and understand where we're at. So making sure that we have an updated job descriptions that outlines the essential duties of our positions, what workloads are, you know, is there challenges, is there opportunities, what's the demand on employees, um, inventory of, you know, procedures that, you know, we have to have and, and things that maybe we can uh, streamline and make more efficient, and what types of training and 
position redundancy do we have today? Do we have the adequate amount of backup um, if somebody were to leave um, or not be able to perform a task? And so just looking at that from a bottom up perspective, I think is also very helpful from a succession planning standpoint. So additional phases um, in this process, there's a lot of different things you can look at from a workforce planning perspective. Um, obviously, as we look at our organizational structure, there can be adjustments to that. So redesigning, restructuring based on, you know, the needs of our organization. Maybe it's COVID-based, maybe it is just um, economic conditions. Maybe it's uh, the use of new technology that streamlines some of our processes. Um, so there's a number of reasons uh, why organizational design comes into play from a, a workforce planning perspective. Um, <coughs> excuse me, you know, succession planning for leadership and key operational positions is important, as well as future leadership identification. I think this is important and it's piece of the puzzle that maybe a lot of organizations don't communicate adequately. I would say if you are have a succession planning process in place, you want to let that person know that they're part of that process, that you're willing to, um, that the organization is willing to dedicate time resources that we're looking you to be a future leader in the organization. And that will help to gain buy-in and retention from our high performing employees. The last thing that you know we want to do is have somebody flagged as a high performing employee that we think we could bring up into a leadership position, but not tell them, not try to grow them uh, personally, professionally, <clears throat> and have them leave the organization because they're just quite frankly unaware that you know we've we've picked them or designate them as somebody that we think can be a leader in the organization. So something to consider is that bringing people in and being transparent about that process and future leadership options, I think is, is um, a positive for these types of um, engagements. Uh, you, you know, a lot of times we'll look at, you know, work options more important today than ever. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are working from home. Uh, it's, it's what, uh, you know, some of the, the younger workforce um, wants or is looking for in a, in a position. <clears throat> Compensation is always, you know, a big one when you talk about attracting and retaining people. I can tell you from an HR perspective, though, you got to have, you got to be competitive to attract and retain people. But let's say I give somebody a raise, that person's going to be happy for a month or two. So it's definitely up there. But after that, um, they're, ready for their next raise or it's not as meaningful to them. What's meaningful to employees is to have the opportunity to grow within an organization, to have a good relationship with their managers or management team, to feel secure in their roles and to have recognition, right? So um, those cultural things are even more important, I would say, than compensation, right? Because again, compensation, I'm happy for a couple months, but then you know I'm back to where I was and I'm already looking forward to a new raise. Um, you know, looking at culture, diversity, inclusion is important. Um, a couple others that I'll just touch base on, you know, uh, consolidation and reduction in workforce. Uh, we talked a little bit about recruiting and retention taxes too. So this, again, this is just a list of different types of activities that we'll typically associate or see with workforce or succession planning. Okay. So one of the biggest challenges I think for state and local governments is how to prepare for that next generation of employees um, and a management level folks. Um, one of the things that we often miss in succession planning is that it should be gradual and thoughtful with lots of sharing of information and knowledge and perspectives. So that is almost a non-event when it happens, right? So again, it's that Anne McCauley from uh, Xerox, former CEO, really is sharing that thought that it's just ingrained and built in our culture that you know we want to, to um, have a you know, workforce succession planning process and that we're gonna bring people along so that when a transition does happen, it's just 
you know, it's not an event. It's just something that we've been preparing for and that our culture um, is set up to absorb. So there's a lot of benefits, again, with succession planning. Um, it lowers key personnel risk, um, facilitates execution of strategy for your most important resources, your people, right? I mean, so, you know, you look at, a number of organizations, including RSM, what's our most important resource? It's our people. So understanding how we can um, identify training or uh, advances or advantages to the people within our organization, again, our most important asset, really helps to define and build that culture that we were talking about of growth um, and succession planning. It really does help to retain those high performers, again, if I show that I'm invested in an employee, uh, employee's growth, and that, I don't wanna say grooming, but that we're grooming them for a leadership position, um, bringing them along, giving them the opportunity to, to grow, um, providing trainings to them, that's gonna ultimately help to retain those employees. And it, and it provides buy-in to the process, right? If you tell me, hey, Michael, um, you know, I'd like to, you know, in five years, I'd like to see you be, you know, the manager of uh, the finance department. Well, if there's not steps taken in between, that really doesn't support or, you know, strengthen my view that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of this cultural shift in uh, allowing organizations to uh, provide the resources, capabilities, and training to, to bring me to where I need to be going forward. So ultimately by, <clears throat> by showing employees, um, by showing employees that we are behind them, um, that does pro provide that, that increased buy-in. Um, and it really can help us to achieve our objectives as an organization. So another quick example you know, we've got um, a mission critical department in charge of managing uh, a complex fund. Um, but a key manager left. Um, they were, had an uh, accident on long-term disability. And so, you know, that situation, a lot of times that work load will fall onto one person. Um, and that person, you know, if we're, if we're staff lean, might not know all the processes and procedures um, that were performed. Um, and, you know, if there's not up-to-date documentation that makes that process even, even harder. So, um, you know, that makes it tough. I mean, basically you've got to jump in and, and try to figure it out, right? Um, so, you know, if you have to go in and just dig in, understand, you know, what that one person who's, by the way, swamped because they're probably doing their position and another position um, are doing. Um, you have to be able to document that. Um, and it, you know, that definitely impacts um, customer service to our constituents. It impacts the quality of our work. It impacts performance. Um, and so, you know, this is just an example of if, if we don't have, um, you know, redundancies, uh, cross-training, uh, in place that can impact our business if, if somebody was able to, um, or so, if somebody left the organization or could not perform their duties in a certain amount of time. So just something to think about, right? Even if we have some, some uh, you know, we've got backfills or we've got people who are cross-trained on um, processes, that's definitely a function of um, succession and workforce planning as well. So some key steps, um, you know, identifying those key positions. Again, we don't want it just for chief officers. We want it for um, key positions within the organization. I think what's important is that we also have a formal, a formal policy or procedure, right? That's transparent and shown to, um, or, or communicated to folks within the, the succession planning program. So often, you know, we go in and, and help clients really say, yeah, yeah, we've got this person identified. Well, you know, have you told them? No, we haven't told them. Have you set them up with any training or any any resources to, to build their knowledge, skills, and abilities? No, we haven't really done. So, so there's this aspect of you know, organizations are thinking about it, but just not totally 
fulfilling the duties of a, a proper succession planning process. Um, so just providing that and, and having leadership involved in that process, I think is definitely important. And again, if we look at that life cycle, you know, after we've got, you know, our strategy, our tactics, um, processes in place, we just want to make sure that we're continuing to check in, uh, review and communicate with those folks. Again, ingraining that into our, our culture um, as, as we move forward with succession planning. So um, a couple of examples um, that you could start to ask, uh, you know, as you as you begin succession planning, or if you have a process, but maybe haven't asked these questions, I think they're just good to think about. So, you know, if each person were to go down this list and say, what am I the go-to first person for? What do only I know and nobody else knows? If I, you know, left my position today, um, would it get done? Um, would it not get done? <laughs> Interestingly, I work with a lot of payroll people and, it, you know, some of them have not taken, you know, we've got like a weekly payroll. It's been years since they've taken a, you know, a vacation because ultimately they've got payroll to do every week. So, you know, if they were to leave, it would definitely be difficult to get that payroll process. I'm not saying it couldn't be done, um, but might be difficult to get that payroll process to moving forward. So an example of just, you know, understanding um, who relies on you, what your processes are, um, and if you were, if, if, you know, you or, you know, person in that position was, 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 uh, was leaving the organization, what does that mean for us? Um, and what does that mean if we haven't been involved in uh, succession planning activities? So we talked a little bit about, you know, our, our, our audience and our baby boomers and attracting and retaining folks. Um, you know, traditional incentives, we talked about those. I mean, they're great. Uh, but baby boomers um, and gen, gen Xers don't value the same types of things, right? So um, we need to understand what our workforce looks like, what the various groups um, are interested in, what's meaningful to them. Again, that could be work, that could be training, that could be benefits, could be compensation. I, I think those all come into play as we, as we look at those and, and really try to attract and retain um, different populations of people. Because again, the, the, the workforce is very diverse today. Um, you know, and as we start to have more millennials enter the, enter the workforce, you know, they're really interested in you know work from home, work life balance. Um, they are looking for immediate feedback from managers. They want that mentoring and that um, development opportunity that succession planning provides. Um, so, so definitely a big piece of you know as we bring this new um, you know as we bring this new group of managers up within the organization, how can we make the process most meaningful to them so that we can retain their services and grow them to be successful leaders of the organization. <clears throat> and this next slide just really talks about, um, you know, how does our culture work um, and how does that perpetuate succession planning that works for our organization. So just again, feeling employees feeling connected to work, knowing knowing what's expected of them is you know an important piece of that puzzle, um, and just having the guidance um, and ability to to work with certain guardrails and uh, processes in place that that drive you towards um, being successful in your role and also increasing your knowledge, skills, and abilities for the success of the organization. You know, these, these next couple of slides, I've, I've got a few left here, um, but I just thought this was interesting from the Center for State and Local Government Excellence. You know, if we look at this one, it, you know, it's really defining trends and what's important and what's not important. You know, you'll see workforce planning, 67% <clears throat> um, indicated that workforce was plan, planning was important. 
Um, you know, I think that's huge. You know, employee engagement and employee morale were at 84 and 86%. So some of these things that we've talked about <coughs> in our presentation so far really are reflected in some of the data that we're seeing from state and local governments. I would, however, be interested, you know, 67% said workforce succession planning was important. I'd be interested to see some statistics around how many organizations are actively actually doing succession planning. Um, again, I, I would say, you know, maybe a third of that group probably has a, a solid process in place. So there's always room for improvement, but I just thought that was uh, interesting as I was going through um, and putting this together. So a, a question, you know, do you have enough activity focused on what will truly impact your target audience? So, um, you know, this next set of data is, is really just common actions taken for employee retention. Um, there's some different things that, you know, we can do as an organization to um, retain people, you know, uh, and understand what, what is driving our employees today, whether they stay with the organization or they decide to leave the organization. Um, so again, just some thoughts around, um, you know, benefits, compensation, um, training, culture, all, the, all that good stuff. So I, I have one last example here. I'm gonna go through it pretty quick because I know we're out, about out of time. But ultimately it was an audit that we did for uh, a housing authority where, you know, essentially in public sector organizations, government, public sector, you know, there, there definitely is some turnover, right? Uh, with um, rollover of, you know, uh, elected officials, right? Um, and so, you know, they wanted us to come in and, and take a look at the organization because essentially, um, you know, a new mayor got elected. Uh, this particular CEO of the housing authority moved to another group within the, the same city, but a different function and took eight executives with him. Uh, and so, you know, just understanding what risk is there, you, you know, what we found was they did have a succession planning process, but it just wasn't really documented. Um, they didn't have core competencies defined. So if you remember, we talked about identifying what we're looking for in employees competency wise, and if that's achieved, then we bring them through the, 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 the process of, um, of succession planning. Um, and just really documenting and making sure we're flagging high performing employees, right? So if we know somebody's high performing, let's make sure that we're nourishing their growth to make them successful within the organization. Um, so just some different recommendations around documenting those processes. Um, defining core competencies, making sure we have recommendations uh, around a standard, standard process for identifying those high performers. And this next recommendation really is just to determine or have a structure in place for determining people who are high, high, high potential high performance. Um, so essentially, you know, if somebody falls on this nine box talent review as um, a high performer and high potential, that's definitely somebody we want to flag in our succession planning process. If they're a low performer with low potential, uh, maybe at this point in this, their career, we're not ready to you know, invest and we don't know that they can be a leader within the organization. So just having some sort of methodology on how to um, define those folks, um, you know, I think is important in the process. So just some common pitfalls. I mean, again, we talked about most of these, but making it part of the organization. I think one of the things, you know, un underestimating the, the changing nature of work, especially um, during COVID and post COVID. I think one of the things from a takeaway perspective that's, that's most important is that, you know, we just make sure um, that we understand that, you know, these are fully customizable plans. It's not a one size fits all. Um, you know, as long as we've got some sort of process in place and we're mindful of the succession planning process, um, you know, that is at least a step in the right direction. And we can continue to add in um, additional 
aspects of that succession planning process and build them into our culture to where, you know, in the future, um, again, it's not an all or nothing or one size fits all. It's a gradual growth uh, of that process and what that looks like. So again, a couple of takeaways, be proactive, make succession planning routine and, you know, tell your approach to what is most urgent or what makes the most mad sense to your organization. So I appreciate it. I know we're right at time. Um, I can definitely stay on if there's any questions or thoughts the group has. Please feel free to enter them in the chat or you can turn on your camera and your uh, unmute yourself and ask the question live of Michael. I don't see anything coming in, Michael. Yeah. Well, I, so I will turn it back over to Larry to close out the session. Great. Well, again, we want to thank Michael uh, for all this important information. Uh, there's a lot of succession, a lot of uh, employees retiring soon. So that's a lot of information to, to digest. I uh, also want to thank RSM and uh, their support of KSGFOA and this conference. Uh, make sure that you go on the KSGFOA website, uh, look up RSM on there and look up their information. Um, and, uh, Feel free to contact Michael because I think a lot of us could uh, yeah. use that. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. We hope that you join us at 1015 for COVID and the municipal bond uh, market. Thank you all. We'll see you at 1015.